Forget, if you will, about the Olympics, surfing competitions, Guinness World Records. Let's slow things down a bit and discuss something really tasteful. Marmalade, enough to make people jelly. It might have originated in Portugal, it comes from a Portuguese word, but it has millions of devoted fans in the United Kingdom. And at the World Marmalade Awards, an event that's been held for 19 years now, there are thousands of entries from places thousands of miles away, like Hawaii, Japan, and Australia. Many of the marmalades that are more local are made with bitter Sevilla oranges from Spain, which are prepared in January and February for this spring event. The ingredients are simple, citrus juices and peels, water, sugar. The event benefits charity to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars raised, and while creating the perfect marmalade isn't an exact science, according to one attendee, the overall winner of the competition said it's an absolute thrill, which might also be described as totally sweet. From a marmalade event to a medical achievement, we've got some dynamic topics on the world from A to Z. I'm Carl Azus, so happy you're hanging out with us today. In March, we told you about the first living medical patient to receive a genetically modified pig kidney. In April, an American woman became the first living patient to get both a pig kidney and a mechanical heart pump. This is part of a newer branch of medical research that's trying to find alternatives to human organs. The reason is simple, there just aren't enough of them to meet the need. Smithsonian Magazine reports there are more than 100,000 people waiting for an organ transplant in the US, and almost 90% of them need a kidney. Taking one from a pig, changing its genes so the human body's more likely to accept it, and then implanting it is not an approved medical procedure at this point. But it's being allowed on an experimental basis when patients have no other options and are likely to die. The cost of a human organ transplant is several hundred thousand dollars, and a modified pig organ procedure would be enormous according to a Harvard professor. But if it's successful, costs could decrease as the practice increases. When that opportunity first came to me, I was like, I gotta try it. From her bed in the intensive care unit at NYU Langone, Lisa Pisano says she's optimistic about the outcome of her surgery, which combined a mechanical heart pump and a transplant of a gene-edited pig kidney. I feel the best I've felt in a long time. Pisano said she'd exhausted all other medical resources. She had heart failure and end-stage kidney disease, but couldn't have a standard heart or kidney transplant due to other chronic medical conditions and the overall lack of donor organs in the U.S. She only had weeks to live. Dr. Robert Montgomery, who led the surgery, says the gene-edited pig kidney was a match and an immediately available organ option. We didn't know if it would work, but we had circumstantial evidence to believe that it would, and it did. Experts say xenotransplants, which put animal organs into people, are crucial to solving the organ shortage. Gene editing also allows for precise edits to a pig's DNA to help keep the human body from recognizing the animal's organs as foreign and rejecting them. Alpisano has a long way to go. Her doctor says she's doing well. The worst case scenario, if it doesn't work, it might work for the next person. At least somebody's going to benefit from it. On this date in world history. All aboard! Amtrak began operating across the U.S. on May 1st, 1971. The railway company, which received some funding from the federal government, took over inner city rail services which had been shared by private companies. Amtrak now serves over 500 cities in 46 states and the District of Columbia. Octung baby! The U2 incident began on May 1st, 1960 but had nothing to do with the band. Cold War tensions flared when the Soviet Union shot down an American spy plane in Soviet airspace and captured pilot Gary Powers, who ejected. Proof of U.S. reconnaissance missions over the Soviet Union led to the collapse of an international conference involving the two countries and others. Powers was convicted of spying but was freed by the Soviet Union in a prisoner swap with the U.S. in 1962. And New York's Empire State Building was dedicated on this date in 1931. President Herbert Hoover turned on the building's lights from his desk in the White House. The 102-story Art Deco building was the tallest in the world at that time. Ah, world of knowledge. 
What book by American geologist Gilbert Ellis Bailey was published in 1915? Farming in Shell, Sustainable Agriculture, Old Farmer's Almanac, Vertical Farming. The term and title that Bailey coined was used differently than it is today, but his name was Vertical Farming. The modern practice aims to produce more crops in less space, buildings instead of fields, and it's been around for decades. Vertical farming's only profitable for certain crops, and there's debate about whether it can be called natural or organic since it's not done in nature. Myrna Brown has more pros and cons. Farmers in Georgetown, Kentucky still grow their leafy greens outdoors, in rows, and rooted in the earth's soil. But it's a different story at one facility in Cleburne, Texas. Lettuce is stacked in pods from the floor to the ceiling, growing in nutrient-enrich water. And instead of soil and sun, these plants are thriving under indoor artificial lights that mimic the sun. Controlled environment advocates say growing food indoors uses less water and land and allows for food to be grown closer to consumers. We've come to a point of necessity that like traditional ag is not the most convenient or environmentally friendly way to grow things on a large scale and produce them as quickly as we need them. But skeptics like Tom Camara, a plant physiologist, say unlike indoor farming, traditional farming supports the environment by creating natural habitats. This farm is supporting those trees and those patches of forest and these meadows. <laughs> and you know, there's, there's hawks and, and uh, uh, other birds flying overhead. And you're not gonna find that on an indoor farm. An indoor farm doesn't have any of those benefits. Camara also questions the sustainability of operations like this, farms that often require intensive and expensive artificial light. But proponents of vertical farming argue the technique allows plants to grow in any environment, 24-7, 365 days a year. The Blackhawks of Bloomfield are circling overhead today. These birds are part of Mr. Varner's class. Bloomfield Hills High School is in the Wolverine State of Michigan. Great to see you this Wednesday. On the East Coast, we land in North Carolina. Miss McDaniel's class is online at Hunter Huss High School, home of the Huskies from Gastonia. And at Pleasant View Middle School, hear the lions roar from Mr. Mayfield's class. Shout out to everyone watching in Pueblo, Colorado. If you think adjusting a giraffe's neck would be a pain in the neck, listen for the crack. Here's how this Oklahoma chiropractor describes it. Being able to work on a giraffe is a, is a chiropractor's dream. I mean, it's the largest neck in the world. Dr. Joran Whitley was called in because Jerry the giraffe, owned by a private rancher, had a chewing issue. His jaw was not moving to the left. So Dr. Whitley stuck his neck out trying to adjust Jerry's. What does it feel like to adjust a giraffe? Their hair is pokey and their, their tongues are really slimy. Oh, it's like a short haired cactus. Along with his human patients, Dr. Whitley specializes in animals, mainly dogs. I heard that. But also chickens. And after Dr. Whitley adjusted this injured bat, he says it was once again able to climb and hang upside down. He's even adjusted sedated lions. Like this one in South Africa. Skeptics say chiropractic has no basis in science, that there's no proof it works on humans or animals. But Jerry's owner told the Washington Post the giraffe's chewing improved after his adjustment. And look at that reaction. One commenter called it the look of bliss. And they're a lot more appreciative, I think, than some of my human patients. Guess the giraffable one realized it was a tall order. A vertebrazen exercise under high acupressure requiring a gun steady hand to snap, crackle, and pop the spinal points of pain, even if the animal agrees it was chiropractical and a way to decompress. We're glad to see it was well adjusted. I'm Carl Azuz, popping neck level puns on the world from A to Z. You are the best part of what we do, and it would mean the world to see you again tomorrow.